The British balloonists first tried to cross the Pacific in 1989 from the city of Miyakonojo in southern Japan. They failed in a most spectacular way. A year, almost to the day, after the failure of their previous attempt to cross the Pacific Ocean by hot air balloon, Richard Branson and Per Lindstrand returned to Miyakonojo, Japan, just as they had promised. Well, it looks pretty awful weather, isn't it? Well, typhoon time. Yes, <laughs> You're not meant to have a typhoon at this time of year in Japan. What are you doing? Forecast is calm by three o'clock. Jules? Jules? The ground crew had calm. already been there two weeks. There's more grey hairs, Richard. Yes, I know. A few more by the end, I think. That's true. <laughs> What you're saying is that typhoon may miss us and disappear off. It, it could. It could head straight. The weather at the launch site had been consistently bad. Meteorologist Paul Head had no good news to tell. Like a uh, connecting mechanism and bring it up toward us again. It's, that is a very distinct possibility. Well, all we can do is um, wait and hope for the best. Their task was to fly their balloon from Miyakonojo in southern Japan, 6,200 miles due east to make a landfall somewhere on the west coast of the United States. Their plan was to ride inside the jet stream in a current of air that travels from west to east at speeds of 200 miles an hour. As to the jet's behavior, not enough is known about it. For example, during the Atlantic, there were a lot of people saying, you cannot fly a balloon inside it, you got tossed out. Well, we proved them wrong. You can, in fact, live right inside a jet stream. And now, we hope we're going to prove that we can live a balloon right inside a trans-Pacific jet stream. A hot air balloon has a limited amount of time, limited amount of fuel, uh, which heats the hot air envelope itself. So in order to get up into the jet stream and get across, we have a limited amount of time. Uh, it's unlike a helium balloon, where you can just keep dropping ballast as you keep going, and eventually you're going to run out of ballast. In this case, we run out of fuel. When you run out of fuel, it's a lot more serious. The problem with the jet is that it will always drag bad weather with it. You know, you don't have a jet and blue sky. The sea state is likely to be about 20, 25 foot waves on a jet, a good jet. Now, when you're flying in a balloon, you're actually flying at the speed of the jet stream. Currently, over Mekonojo, it's traveling at about 120 knots. You could hang a tissue over the side of the uh, gondola if there was a gondola, in this case it's actually a space capsule. Uh, and this tissue would stay on the side of the balloon and travel along with them and not blow off. You know, the statistics, I suppose, are against this. Um, it took 12, 12 attempts at the Atlantic for um, a balloon to be successful in crossing. Uh, there were eight people lost their lives. Uh, no one's yet attempted the Pacific in a hot air balloon. But I'm sort of trying to remind people that, you know, don't get your hopes raised too much. Um, you know, we've, we've still, we still haven't even managed to get this thing off the ground yet. Traditionally, with, with any kind of flying, the dangerous times come on takeoff and landing, but there is another scenario with this flight, and that's the possible ditching in the Pacific. I think they both know that if they ditch in mid-Pacific, in certain circumstances, is almost certainly fatal. If they are north of their desired track, if they're out of uh, easy reach of shipping, uh, they're in very high seas, they may have to get, take to the life rafts. That's a likely scenario if they land in the Pacific. And in a life raft for between 10 and 20 hours in the Pacific at this time of the year is not survivable. In the Royal Hotel Miyakonojo, the team rehearse a disaster scenario. Because of the involvement of Richard as chairman of an airline, it's very important that we stay within the confines of this plan. Now, what we will do if an emergency is declared, if this is any kind of an emergency at all, we will all know that by uh, the introduction of a code word which must absolutely stay within this room. <clears throat> we don't want to write it down. It's easy, easy to remember. 
And the code name is Spano. So if we hear at all, up, we're into Operation Spano, then we are into an emergency situation that um, is outside of our control. What, what worries me about it is that, um, of course, we've got families involved. Most of the families will be with us. But there's lots of relatives and friends of Richard and Pers mm. that are going to be... They're going to be uncontrollable to some yes. extent. Yeah. So there is a secondary problem as well in that if something like this happens, a disaster scenario, the press tend to go mad. And I don't want to talk to the press no. until no. we've gone into the total disaster. Absolutely. And I am then helping to support the survival of the airline, the survival yeah. of Richard's family as a family unit, no. without being bothered mm. by the media and doing mm. the things that Richard wants me to do in the event of his death. The weather remained unsettled. The team waited in vain for a suitable fast jet stream and good launch conditions. Richard Branson first learned to fly a hot air balloon four years ago. Branson, one of the richest men in Britain, owns and runs the Virgin Entertainment Empire with record, airline and media interests worldwide. His children, Sam, age five, and Holly, age nine, have joined him during the long wait in Japan. Bye-bye. I think they all think we're off, to, off, off across the Pacific. The British national anthem, sung by Japanese, greets the two balloonists. Per Lindström lives in England where he runs Thunder and Colt balloons, the designers and builders of the Trans-Pacific craft. An ex-Swedish Air Force pilot, he is one of the world's most experienced balloonists. No one's crossed the Pacific with a hot air balloon. Uh, they crossed it with a helium balloon, which is totally, totally different. And, uh, Helium balloon flying is basically flying. It's not technology. It's just a bubble of helium and off you go. Gas balloons were flying for hundreds of hours in the 1920s. A gas balloon can almost circumnavigate the Earth as it is receiving its lift from a captive gas and needs no replenishing to do so. Early this century, engine-driven Zeppelins filled with hydrogen gas regularly flew non-stop across the Atlantic. But it wasn't until 1970 that any serious attempt was made in an unpowered balloon. British balloonist Malcolm Brighton and two others set off from North America. They came down in a storm off Newfoundland. They were never seen again. In 1973, Bobby Sparks was lucky to escape with his life when a violent storm brought him down, again off Newfoundland. Whatever the storm wanted to do with me, that's what it did. It was struck by lightning or lightning discharged near the balloon about 45 or 50 times. It vulcanized the rip panel in the balloon so that I could not deflate it when I landed the next morning, uh, set the boat on fire, and for my own point of view, after a while, you get used to the lightning. Um, the problem was I was dying from hypothermia. Whatever the wind and the storm wanted to do, that's what the balloon and I did. The next to try, the following year, was Thomas Gatch. Ten plastic balloons were filled with helium gas and ready to carry Thomas Gatch on an attempt to cross the Atlantic. Gatch, a former army officer, said his main worry was passing airplanes. If all goes well, Gatch expects to arrive in Spain sometime Thursday. He never made it. The Atlantic claimed him in mid-ocean. Four attempts followed in the next three years. Five balloonists died. Yet still they set out. In 1978, Maxie Anderson and Ben Abruzzo flew in Double Eagle, a helium balloon. When we were asked before we left why we were going to make this flight, 
We said, why not? Well, I say now, I can tell you why not. You gotta be crazy. Crazy or not, they did try again with a third man, Larry Newman. They finally went all the way, landing in a wheat field 50 miles from Paris. Three years later, they repeated their success when they flew 5,700 miles, the longest balloon flight in history, across the Pacific from Japan to America. No other attempts were made on the Pacific till February 1989, when a Japanese balloonist, Fuma Niwa, tried it in a homemade gas balloon. He covered barely 500 miles in three days and was rescued from the sea. What many balloonists had felt was absolutely impossible was to cross the Pacific in a hot air balloon. Impossible because the weight of the fuel needed to produce sufficient hot air would require a balloon to support it so vast as to be unrealistic. The furthest a hot air balloon had ever flown was 85 miles in 1973. By 1978, it was 379 miles. In 1985, 913 miles. In 1987, Branson and Lindstrom flew the Atlantic in a giant hot air balloon. They now intend to more than double their own distance record. The balloon Lindstrom had built to cross the Pacific is as high as the Statue of Liberty, big enough comfortably to contain a jumbo jet. They had behind them a successful transatlantic crossing achieved in July 1987. Despite losing fuel tanks on takeoff, despite experiencing difficulty in controlling the great balloon, which was 20% smaller than the one in which they hoped to cross the Pacific. They crashed down in Ireland, ricocheted away, were rescued from the seas, and achieved the longest journey by hot air balloon. Branson also swore he would never do it again. It's 04 hours, Greenwich Mean Time. BBC World Service presents News Desk. The headlines. President Saddam Hussein of Iraq has said that any last-minute initiative to avoid war in the Gulf must now come from the United States. Six weeks after they arrived in Japan, the world news was as bad as the weather. Mr. Perez de Quellar, now in Paris, has said, God only knows whether it will be war or peace. And the other main story, there have been moves to ease tension in the... The other news was that the Japanese balloonist Fumio Niwa was again going to try to cross the Pacific in a helium gas balloon. He took off from Yokohama at 2 a.m. on January the 11th. He's trying the first solo attempt, and he will assume use the same weather pattern as we do. I wish him the best of luck and um, hope he makes it. But um, I think he'd be struggling with the size of the balloon he's got. It's a bit too small to get across. Six hours later, he radioed that he was in difficulties. He ditched, strapped himself to the gondola, in which he had traveled 200 miles. It was 17 hours before he was picked up. He was dead from exposure and exhaustion. At Mia Kanojo, the British team began to lay out their balloon. Everything looked good for a launch. Actually, let's start the irritant. If you can't get that one out, then What? If you can't get it out, you can't play the balls. <laughs> now you have a parachute. <laughs> I think we'll uh, get it out by hook or by truck. They waited for dusk and the breeze to drop. No, that's yeah. true. This is, this is the night. I feel quite confident. <laughs> Back where the wind. <laughs> <laughs> I have all my toes crossed right now. It's very difficult to walk. Yeah. <laughs> Painstakingly, hour after hour, they prepared the balloon. The wind settled, but changed direction. 
So, equally carefully, they rolled up the balloon and swung the capsule around, then moved the balloon in line with the wind. They unrolled the balloon yet again, before finally giving up when the wind picked up. The problem is that to inflate a balloon with four miles an hour of wind, it, it, it's so big that it's got so much inertia in it that it could very easily uh, ripped to pieces. However, we believe that by four o'clock today, uh, we will have perfect conditions for inflation. And so it proved. Happy at moment. Yes, it's been. Uh, we've been through a lot of uh, a lot of lows to get this far. from Pacific Fly. Do you have an exact takeoff time? Over. The door is now uh, being put in right there. He's obviously got his, um, his parachute on uh, the, uh, just in case. Well, we've now sealed, sealed the door and um, we've now got to seal off a few, a few other bits in the capsule so to make it absolutely certain it's Right, you drop right back down to 
25,000 feet at the moment. Pacific base, Pacific base, this is Richard Ever. In the Project Control Center in San Jose, California, meteorologist Bob Rice and his team checked the balloon's progress. Lindstrom is having difficulty getting the balloon into the fast-moving jet stream. Wind shear on the balloon is affecting the performance of the burners. Uh, no speed would go any higher. Our last average speed was 164 knots. We've lost all flames. Now the balloon is descending at a reasonably fast speed. Okay, I think we've got some flame back, yeah. Well, I don't think we have one, but we seem to have lost it again. We definitely had it back a moment ago. Just to let you know, we're still without flames, and we're trying to get them back on. Over. Roger, Pacific Fire, receive and understand. Oh, you got a flame there. You got a flame. You got a flame. I'm sure. Yep, you got a flame back. Just come back. Push. Yeah. Back strong. Uh, you'd be pleased to know the indication was faulty on the uh, indicator. It's sort of one of those sort of elementary things one's not meant to do. But we're, what, we, what we hadn't realised was we'd actually uh, the fuel had run out. So, um, but, but, but the readings in the gauge were, wasn't right. But anyway, we're all well now. We've got flames flaring out above us. Over. But one thing we do know is it's empty. Uh, could you let us know when you do drop it over? Uh, we certainly will. I thought we weren't going to have any frights this bloody trip. What's happening? <laughs> over and out. out. Right, we're going to uh, release the tank. Uh, yeah, I've got taken. Let's try to, sorry, yeah. try to um, drop it away into the sea. And if we're lucky, we might, although it's not the right side of the where the camera is, we might see it plummeting into the sea. I'm not sure where our, whether, whether our cameras can pick up, but just.